Secrets of Potosi by Donald Robert Elton, copyright 2024, all rights reserved. Narrated by Jeremiah Fletcher. Chapter 1. First Contact. The farther back you can look, the farther forward you are likely to see. Winston Churchill. Not all treasure is silver and gold, mate. Jack Sparrow, Pirates of the Caribbean. Seville, Spain, 1543. In the grand halls of Seville, whispers of vast wealth across the Atlantic had reached a fever pitch. The tales of a distant land rich with silver had captured the imagination of the Spanish court, igniting a hunger among nobles, merchants, and adventurers alike. These stories passed from one mouth to another and spoke of Cerro Rico, a mountain so filled with silver that it was said to shine like a beacon in the Andean sun. It was rumored that the mountain's veins ran deep with precious metal, enough to fill Spain's coffers for centuries and restore its glory. To a nation still reeling from the costly wars of the Reconquista, these stories were nothing short of divine providence, a gift from God to reaffirm Spain's place as the dominant power in Europe. The first inklings of Potosí's riches reached Spain through the letters and reports of early explorers and traders who ventured into the vast and unknown lands of the New World. Rumors of a rich hill spread rapidly, fueled by the accounts of merchants and adventurers who had heard about a mountain brimming with silver from indigenous traders and miners. Word of mouth quickly reached the ears of Spanish officials, who saw the potential for immense wealth to finance their imperial ambitions. Don Francisco de Toledo, a seasoned conquistador and the newly appointed viceroy of Peru, listened intently to these tales. A deep sense of duty drove Toledo to the Spanish crown and a thirst for glory. He had fought in many battles, seen the treasures of the new world firsthand, and understood the magnetic allure of such riches. For Toledo and the king's council, Cerro Rico was not just a mountain, but a symbol of opportunity that could transform Spain's fortunes and secure its dominance over European rivals. Toledo's mind filled with vivid images of the mountain's slopes, where veins of silver lay just beneath the surface, ready to be extracted by the indigenous people and transported across the seas to Spain. His thoughts raced with visions of wealth and power that could rewrite history and immortalize his name. We must seize this opportunity, Toledo declared to the assembled nobles, his voice steady but charged with excitement. We must send men to claim the mountain and its riches in the name of the king. This is our chance to restore Spain to greatness. The planning begins. The Spanish crown could have spent more time organizing an expedition to claim Cerro Rico, but there was no time to waste. Hurried orders were dispatched to assemble a group of skilled conquistadors experienced miners, and priests tasked with converting the indigenous peoples. The mission was twofold, to secure the mountain's wealth and to spread the Catholic faith, thus legitimizing their conquest in the eyes of both the church and the European powers. Toledo and his advisors mapped out the route to the heart of the Andes. Considering the logistical challenges of transporting men and supplies over vast oceans and through inhospitable terrain, they knew the journey would be long and arduous, requiring a careful balance of strength, strategy, and diplomacy. They would have to traverse dense jungles, cross raging rivers, and climb steep mountain passes, all while maintaining the morale and discipline of their men. Toledo understood that their mission was not only about conquering land, but also about securing the loyalty of the indigenous populations. He ordered that gifts be prepared, brightly colored textiles, mirrors, and other goods unfamiliar to the native peoples, to entice and appease them. Simultaneously, the priests were briefed on their role, to convert the indigenous peoples to Christianity and to present the Spanish as bearers of both spiritual and temporal salvation. The Voyage to the New World The journey began in the bustling port of Cadiz where ships were loaded with supplies and men eager for adventure. The crossing of the Atlantic was dangerous, the seas were treacherous, and the weather unpredictable. 
Many of the men had never sailed such distances before, and the journey took its toll. The ships were crowded with soldiers, priests, and miners, each carrying dreams of glory, salvation, or fortune. The months at sea were grueling, filled with the constant threat of storms, disease, and the unknown. As they sailed toward the New World, the men exchanged stories of Cerro Rico, each more unbelievable than the last. They spoke of a mountain where silver was so abundant that it could be chipped away with a knife. Rivers ran clear with the metal, and untold riches awaiting those brave enough to claim them. The mountain was a divine gift for the priests, a sign from God that Spain was chosen to lead the heathens to true faith. Upon reaching the New World, the real journey began. The fleet first landed in Panama, restocking their supplies and preparing for the grueling trek southward. Crossing Panama about 50 miles over land saved about 6,000 miles off the trip had they been forced to cross south of South America through much more dangerous seas. Their path took them through dense jungles and over treacherous mountain passes. The heat was suffocating and the terrain unforgiving. Many men fell ill and some perished along the way. Arriving in Panama City, on Panama's Pacific coast, they boarded ships waiting for them on the route to the port in Callao, Peru. The Trek Through the Andes The journey through the Andes was a test of endurance and willpower. The mountains were vast and imposing, the air thin and difficult to breathe. The path was steep and winding, with treacherous cliffs and deep ravines. Unaccustomed to the high altitudes, the conquistadors struggled to acclimate to the harsh conditions. Horses stumbled and faltered on the rocky paths, and the men were often forced to continue on foot, leading the animals by the reins. Despite the hardships, there was an undercurrent of excitement among the men. The stories of Cerro Rico grew more vivid with each passing day, each step closer to the fabled mountain. They heard tales from local guides about the silver beneath the surface waiting to be claimed. While they didn't encounter many indigenous people during their journey to the Potosi area, they saw signs of them, including signs of a civilized society. The Inca controlled lands from as far north as Panama to as far south as Argentina. Like the Romans in Italy, they needed a system of highways to effectively govern such a large territory, which, in this case, was full of hostile terrain. The Inca roads or trails, known as the Capacnan, meaning Royal Road in Quechua, were an extensive network of pathways that the Inca civilization developed across their empire. The Tawantinsuyu, which stretched over a vast portion of western South America. This intricate road system connected various parts of the empire, covering modern-day Peru, Ecuador, Bolivia, Colombia, Chile, and Argentina. When the Spanish conquistadors arrived in the early 16th century, they encountered this well-developed system of trails, which they utilized for their purposes, but also found challenging due to their design and function. The construction of the Inca roads was a massive undertaking that used the labor of thousands of workers. The Inca trails were primarily designed for llamas, the primary pack animals of the Andes, rather than for horses, which the Spanish brought to the Americas. Several factors made these trails well-suited for llamas, but challenging for horses. The paths were often too narrow for horses. They included steps carved into the rock to accommodate the llama's unique gait and ability to navigate rough terrain that horses could only pass with the risk of falls and injuries. Arriving in Potosí, 1545 after months of difficult travel, the weary, excited group finally arrived at Potosí, the city of silver. Cerro Rico looming large on the horizon was enough to rekindle their spirits. The mountain stood like a silent sentinel, its slopes shimmering with the promise of untold riches. For the conquistadors, it was a moment of triumph. They had reached their destination, the land of silver. But as they set up their encampment on the outskirts of the village, they realized the real challenge lay ahead. The area's indigenous people, wary of the newcomers, watched them with suspicion and fear. The conquistadors knew they would have to tread carefully. 
they would need to negotiate, manipulate, and use both force and diplomacy to achieve their goals. For the Spaniards, the arrival in Potosí marked the beginning of a new day in their quest for wealth and power. They were on the brink of a discovery that would change the region's fate forever, a discovery that would transform Cerro Rico into one of the richest silver mines in history and leave an indelible mark on the indigenous peoples who called this land home. The path to Cerro Rico had been long and treacherous, but the Spaniards believed their journey was beginning. Armed with ambition and the conviction of divine right, they were prepared to lay claim to the Silver Mountain and bend it to their will. Potosí, Peru, 1545 In 1545, Potosí, now in modern-day Bolivia, was part of the Spanish Viceroy of Peru. Perched high in the Andes, the village of Potosí was nestled in the shadow of Cerro Rico, a mountain whose veins ran rich with silver and had long been considered both a blessing and a curse by the local Aymara people. The early morning mist still clung to the peaks, and the sun had barely crested the horizon when Tupac Amaru, the principal deputy of Aymara Chief Pacha, pushed open the flap of the chief's hut. His face was grim, his eyes shadowed with worry. Chief Pacha looked up from his meal of potatoes and quinoa. His lined face, weathered by years of leadership and battle, tightened into a frown as he noted the expression on his deputy's face. Pacha set down his wooden spoon, his gaze sharpening. What news do you bring, my trusted deputy? He asked, his voice low and steady. Tupac Amaru took a deep breath, his chest rising and falling heavily. The news he carried was weighty, threatening to disrupt the fragile peace they had maintained for so long. My lord, I bring word that a group of strange people have arrived in our lands. They call themselves Spaniards and claim to have defeated the mighty Inca Empire. They are headed towards Potosí to take over the region and find silver and other treasures from Cerro Rico. The mountain's name hung between them like a specter. Cerro Rico had been a source of pride and fear. The Aymara knew its riches might attract the greed of outsiders, but until now, they had been spared the full wrath of conquest. Pacha's face remained stoic, but a flicker of unease crossed his eyes. Spaniards, he muttered, testing the foreign word on his tongue. These are the men who brought the great Inca Empire to its knees? Tupac Amaru nodded solemnly. Yes, my lord. They come with weapons we have never seen, riding great beasts they call horses. They are clad in armor that glints like the sun, and they hunger for gold and silver with an endless appetite. Pacha stroked his graying beard thoughtfully, his mind turning over the implications. He was a seasoned leader, having inherited his position from his father, and spent his life defending his people from rival tribes and Spanish encroachment under the sanction of the central Inca government that had now fallen. But this news was different. The thought of these invaders taking over their lands and exploiting their riches filled him with a slow-burning anger and a gnawing fear. Tupac Amaru watched his chief closely, waiting for his reaction. He knew the chief to be a man of deep thought who weighed his options carefully before moving. As Pacha's deputy, he had learned to trust his chief's instincts, even when they led them down dangerous paths. We cannot defeat them, not on our own, Pacha finally said, his voice a low rumble. If they have defeated the Inca Empire, they will crush us like an ant beneath their boot. But we cannot surrender our land to them either. We must find a way to protect our people and our culture. Tupac Amaru nodded, sensing the weight of the chief's words. We could assist them in their search for silver? he suggested cautiously. The silver is far more valuable to them than to us. If we offer them our knowledge of the land and the mines, they may be more willing to work with us instead of against us. We must make ourselves indispensable to them. They will see that we must be protected and not harmed. Pacha's gaze was sharp as he considered the idea. 
It is a risky strategy, he said slowly. They may try to kill our leaders, enslave our men, and take our women. But it may be our best chance. We will offer to guide them through the mines and provide them with food and water. But we must keep a watchful eye on their actions and protect our secrets and culture. The chief's words hung heavy in the air. They both knew that silver, abundant in the region, was seen as little more than a shiny metal by the Aymara. To the Spaniards, however, it was a treasure beyond compare, worth risking life and limb to obtain. The Aymara could not understand the greed that drove these men, but they could use it to their advantage. Tupac Amaru nodded in agreement. I will gather our representatives and lead them to meet the Spaniards. We will offer our assistance and try to learn more about their intentions. The chief's eyes softened slightly as he looked at his deputy, who had served him faithfully for many years. You have always been a wise and loyal advisor, Tupac Amaru, he said. But we must be prepared for anything. The Spaniards may not be the only threat to our lands and people. Tupac Amaru left the hut with a solemn bow, his mind racing with plans and contingencies. The village would need to be prepared for whatever came next, whether cooperation or conflict. Outside, Chief Pacha called for a town meeting, and soon the villagers gathered in the central square, their faces filled with worry and curiosity. Pacha stood at the front of the crowd, his expression grave as he prepared to deliver the news. My people, he began, his voice carrying over the murmurs, I have called you today to inform you of a grave threat to our lands and way of life. A group of strangers has arrived in our region, and we believe they seek to take control of our mines and exploit our riches. A murmur of concern rippled through the crowd. Pacha held up a hand to quiet them. But do not despair, he continued. We will not let them take what is rightfully ours. We will work together to protect our people and heritage, our most valuable treasure. A young warrior stepped forward, his face a mask of determination. But chief, how can we stand up to the Spaniards? They defeated the Inca Empire. What chance do we have? Pacha nodded solemnly. You are right to be concerned, he said. But we must be smart and strategic in our actions. We cannot fight them on their terms, but we can offer to work with them. We will provide them with guides to navigate the mines and share our knowledge of the land. In doing so, we can protect our people, as they will find their path much more difficult without our assistance. An older woman, her face lined with years of wisdom, stepped forward. But what if they do not want to work with us? What if they take what they want by force? Pacha's expression hardened, his eyes flashing with a fierce determination. If they refuse our offer, we must be prepared to fight. We will gather our strongest warriors and defend our land honorably. We must choose our battles carefully, exploit our knowledge of the territory, and find ways to cut off their supplies and food. We will not let them destroy us and our culture without a fight. And remember, fighting for our culture and future is not always a direct battle. There are other ways to resist. The crowd nodded in agreement, their fear slowly giving way to resolve. They were strong, resilient people, and Pacha knew they would do whatever it took to protect their heritage and way of life. Remember, he said, his voice rising with conviction, we are the Aymara people. We have faced many challenges and hardships before, and we have always emerged stronger. Together, we will overcome this threat and thrive in our lands. Our descendants will continue to prosper long after the Spaniards have come and gone. The crowd cheered, a ripple of hope spreading like a warm breeze. Pacha felt a surge of pride in his people. They were ready to face whatever came their way, and he knew they would not go down without a fight. As the first horses and riders approached, 
the villagers gathered in the town square to get a closer look. The sight of the Spaniards was a shock to the people. They had never seen men like these before, with their strange armor, weapons, and horses, giant animals that behaved as if they were an extension of the soldiers who were, to a man, taller than any of the villagers. The villagers whispered amongst themselves, trying to understand the motives of these outsiders. Some said they were looking for gold. Others feared they wanted to take the mines and make slaves of their people. Meanwhile, town elders had taken it upon themselves to protect their heritage. They journeyed to one of the abandoned mines in the hills, carrying a sacred metal box marked with the Chacana, the Incan cross. The cross, with its four corners ridged with three steps each, represented the three levels of existence, Hana, the upper world inhabited by the superior gods, K, the world of everyday existence, and Uku, or Urin, the underworld inhabited by spirits of the dead, the ancestors, their overlords, and various deities having close contact with the earth plane. The cross was adorned with symbols, a condor, a sacred animal that could carry messages to the spirit world, a puma that symbolized courage and power, and a snake representing knowledge and transformation. The box had their most critical secret artifacts, the foundation of their early traditions and culture. The elders buried it deep within the mine where no one had ventured for generations. With the box safely hidden, they returned to the village, their hearts heavy with the knowledge that they had given up a part of their heritage, but were relieved that their secrets were safe from the Spaniards. The actual hiding place would be a closely guarded secret known only to a few, and knowing the dangers ahead and their own advancing age, they made plans for how future generations might find the artifact to keep their culture alive. As more Spaniards rode into the village, their armor and weapons glinting in the sun, the villagers were left to ponder what their arrival meant. They were apprehensive and uncertain, but curiosity remained, wondering what would come. Little did they know this was the start of a long and tumultuous journey as they struggled to protect their heritage and culture against the outside world's forces. The Spaniards brought with them a culture and a religion vastly different from the villagers, and as time passed, the two groups began to clash. The Spaniards were determined to exploit the land and its riches, and so a struggle for power and control began, shaping the village's future and its people for generations to come. In 1532, Spanish conquistador Francisco Pizarro led a group of Spaniards to what would later become Peru. Despite being vastly outnumbered, the Spaniards defeated the Inca army using horses and superior weaponry. But it was not just their weaponry that gave them the advantage. Unbeknownst to the Spaniards, their most potent weapon was not their arms, but the collection of European diseases they carried, including smallpox, influenza, and measles. These diseases, which preceded their arrival, spread through native South American populations via travelers and trade networks, devastating the Andean population by up to 90% over the next century. At the time, neither the natives nor the invaders understood these diseases' origins or transmission methods, much less how to prevent or treat them. The Spaniards, for their part, saw the plagues as divine providence, a sign that they were destined to conquer and rule these new lands. Following their conquest, the Spaniards took control of the Inca Empire's territories and maintained power over the region for over 300 years, imposing their rule and religion on the indigenous populations. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows across the village, Chief Pacha stood silently, his eyes fixed on the distant mountains. He knew their most significant battle was yet to come, not just against the Spaniards, but against the forces of time and change that threatened to erase their way of life forever. He vowed then that he would do whatever it took to protect his people, their culture, and their heritage, even if it meant striking a deal with the devil himself. With his mind made up, Pacha returned to his hut, his steps heavy but determined. 
He would meet with the Spaniards, negotiate terms, and ensure his people's survival. But he would never forget who they were or where they came from. The Aymara people were strong, proud, and resilient. They had faced many enemies before and would face this new one with the same courage and resolve that had seen them through countless trials. And as long as there was breath in his body, Pacha would ensure their story and legacy would not be forgotten.